a gritty, gritty road win for the University of Tennessee in a place where it's tough to win this year. Mississippi State falls to the Volunteers, 72-63, to and Tennessee now moves to 17-6, and 8-3 and in SEC play. Have won six straight SEC games uh, in a row for the Volunteers. Logan Ward will come on with me here to recap all that was Tennessee and Mississippi State all here on a Thursday, Locked on Balls. <laughs> Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody, and happy Thursday. Welcome into Locked On Balls, your first listen each and every day. Going to be a fun show recapping all that was Tennessee's 72-63 win over Mississippi State's and uh, really, really look forward to getting it, uh, getting into that here with you guys today, as well as my buddy Logan Ward. As you guys know, I do radio at 99.1 The Sports Animal, also the host of this Locked On Balls podcast and a writer for the rival site covering Tennessee football, recruiting, basketball a little bit, and a whole lot more. That's over at VolQuest.com. But uh, one of my cohorts over at The Sports Animal is Logan Ward. And he agreed to come on late, late night, literally burning the midnight oil here tonight to recap a Tennessee win over Mississippi State. Logan, what's up, man? Yeah, Eric, I'm, I tell you what, it's a lot, you know, later than what I'm accustomed to being up. It's kind of funny. I don't go on the air till nine. You go on the air at six, but yep. I go to bed a whole lot earlier than you do just because, I mean, I'm 23. I feel like I'm 55. You're going to be up for a couple more hours. When I get done with this, I'm going to go crash in my bed. So, but hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, you you want to know why I'm up late at night? It's it's this podcast. It's a joy getting to that do money program. Yeah, making that money right. Programming and recording is easy business. It's editing and uploading that I need to hire you as my assistant to do uh, for go. me. Yeah. Initial thoughts here. Well, we'll, we'll get in. We'll we'll uh, we'll unravel everything that was this basketball game. But I mean, you know, at the time of this recording, it ended two minutes ago. Initial thoughts, big takeaways from Tennessee's seventy-two sixty-three win over the Bulldogs. I mean, you mentioned it right there um, in the open. It's a gritty, gritty win, a place that's very tough to play, going on the road to Starkville, the hump, as they call it. And, you know, not a lot of teams have won there. And quite frankly, this Tennessee team has not played well away from Thompson Bowling Arena. Outside of the last, you know, three, four games, going on the road to Vanderbilt, obviously having a big, big game on the road last Saturday against South Carolina. And then you go on the road again tonight, play a very tough team that plays very well on their home floor, that being Mississippi State. You get a very, very gritty win. At times, it didn't look great. You know, we kind of had the custom Tennessee goes out to a early lead and shoots the ball very, very well and very, very efficiently from the floor on the offensive end. Then they kind of have that lull right there in the middle of the game where they're not scoring a whole lot of points. They're turning the ball over. They're not shooting the ball very effectively. They're not stopping guys on defense. But, hey, a gritty, gritty win for Tennessee. Yeah, you mentioned that law, and that law was a Mississippi State 7-0 run uh, to take the lead at 28-27. Uh, towards the end of the first half, uh, Molinar made a made a three-pointer to give Mississippi State the lead. Uh, during that stretch for the Bulldogs, Tennessee had a scoring drought of 250 in the ball game and were one of their last 12 from the field. So that is that law you're speaking of, much like the second quarter law for Tennessee football all this past fall. You, get, you start off strong, you finish strong. But in that second quarter, it's kind of like you had that lull. But then that's what Tennessee basketball has done at points and times this year. But minus that scoring droughts, how you start and how you finish. Tennessee started the game on 11-0 run. It moved all the way up to 14-2 run to begin things off. They were 5-5 five for five to start. Uh, Brandon Huntley Hatfield, who got the start, picked up four quick points. Uh, Vescovy had a key three. You had Uros that had a really nice two down low. And Tennessee jumped out seven of eight from the field to begin the game. So, a great start. How you finished, Tennessee finished on a 6-0 run over the last two minutes and 26 seconds, made eight of their last nine baskets from the field. In turn, Mississippi State turned it over three times in the last 244, four times in the last 424, and ended the game on a scoring drought of 244. So you can withstand that lull that Tennessee's going to have, those scoring droughts, if you start off strong and you finish strong, and that's what Tennessee did uh, here on Wednesday night. And they've done that, and that's what we've seen from this Tennessee team. You know, hey, it it doesn't have to be pretty, okay? You don't have to be Auburn. You don't have to be Kentucky. You don't have to win in a sexy way by scoring 80 points a game. Quite frankly, 
That's not what this team's built to do. That's not what Rick Barnes really coaches his guys up to and to do. And that's never been Rick Barnes' style. Score eighty some points. It's kind of you know the low sixties. You know, getting up there around seventy points a game, and that's fine. Whenever you play as good a defense as what Tennessee does now. Mississippi State's not a great three-point shooting team at all. They shot pretty effectively tonight and, you know, shot the ball, I thought, very, very good. And I thought downright that they were going to win that game going down with, you know, four or five minutes left to go in the game because they took the lead there for a second. But a gritty win for Tennessee, and that's just what Tennessee continued to do. You know, you're, it's not going to be sexy, as I said. You're not Auburn. You're not Kentucky. You don't, you don't have the guys to go up above the rim and score a whole bunch of points. But just what Tennessee did tonight, gut out a big win against a really good opponent on the road. It's a good win for Tennessee. Ugly, but it is a good win. Yeah, but you'll take it all day of the week. And really, 100%. I mean, it's, Tennessee's won uglier games than this, especially this year. I mean, you know, Rick Barnes is a defensive-minded head coach outside, and we always go back to these teams, outside of the the two years when Grant and Admiral were on fire, Kyle Alexander turned into a good player. You had, of course, um, uh, gosh, why am I blanking on their names? Bowden, you had uh, Lamonte. I mean, you know, Jordan Bone. You know, those teams could score at will, right? You know, these this team's starting to learn how it can do that. But for the most part, it's a defensive-minded team. So you know, when you shoot 49% from the field like Tennessee did last night, when you shoot 42% from three and make eight of 19, when you shoot, as, and again, I'll remind everybody, this is one of the worst free throw shooting teams in all of America. When you shoot 89% from the charity stripe, making eight of nine, you will take that every single day. Now, where Tennessee is elite this year, one of the best defensive teams in the country, it allowed Mississippi State to make half of its shots, 50%, 22 to 44 from the field. It was fairly decent from uh, – well, actually, they didn't take that many three-pointers. They made five of 14, so that's actually not a not a great, great mark, still 36%. And then they fouled them, got them to the line, but State, like Tennessee in games past, couldn't manage from the free throw line, making only 14 to 23. So you'll take this offensive performance. Was it the offensive output Tennessee had in a blowout loss to Kentucky? No, which was really good. Was it one of those blowout wins like Tennessee had on the offensive end against, you know, other teams here of late during this win streak? No, A&M. but yeah, A&M 49, 42 and 89 from the field, from three, from, from the charity stripe. You will take that all, all day, every day. And I think one thing that we continue to see, as we have seen the past several games, I say, you know, going back to probably Texas A&M, maybe a couple games before that, the emergence of Josiah Jordan-James. He has finally arrived. Tennessee fans have been saying five-star guy coming in, you know, projected, you know, first-round draft pick out of high school. Maybe a little bit, quite frankly, way too high of expectations for any five-star freshman coming in, especially a developmental guy like Josiah Jordan-James was going to be. What he's done the last three games for this Tennessee team, we've been saying, I have been very, very hard. You know that very well. I've been very hard on Josiah Jordan James this year saying if Tennessee can just get, you know, 10 to 12 out of him a night, they can go from one level all the way up to, you know, a couple levels beyond that. And he's starting to emerge tonight, 18 points again tonight. He's playing unbelievable basketball and at a very, very pivotal time for this Tennessee team. Yeah, and you know that I'm a, you know, everybody listening right now knows I'm a huge believer in Triple J, and I've been on his bandwagon since he got here because, again, sure, he was a five-star. Sure, there was a lot of, you know, and like you said, I thought it was a little overblown, you know, lottery pick out of high school. No, right. he was he was more of a projective, uh, a developmental player, especially on the offensive end, but now he does everything else so well, plays defense, so versatile, he's a team's leading rebounder. But what he's done in this six-game SEC win streak, essentially, is he's been counted on as, as a leading scorer, right? Or a guy that's right up there challenging Chandler, challenging Vescovy. And he did it again you know, last night. 18 points, as you pointed out. Made three, uh, three-pointers, seven to 12 from the field. What Tennessee's getting right now from James offensively is just you, you just want to see how long it'll last, right? Because that's typically not his game. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. If you can get anywhere from seven to 12 points from Triple J every single game, You'll take that all the time, but right now, again, he's challenging. You know, he had a career high against uh, against South Carolina with 20, had 18 last night. He is playing out of his mind. More on Tennessee basketball. It's win over Mississippi State, 72-63. When we return here on Locked on Vols, and more from Logan Ward here in a moment. But first, I want to remind you guys about Bet Online. It's got you covered this season. More props, more odds, more lines than ever before. As football continues its march, through the playoffs, and hey, the big game just days away. All right, betonline.net remains the best spots for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news 
all season long. And it's not just about football. Bet Online has up to the minute info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, along with live real time updates on all the current games. Don't wait to take advantage of all these amazing offers available for the 2022 re- remainder of the football season, basketball season, on into baseball season. Bet Online, it is where the game starts. Hey guys, I want to thank you sincerely for making Locked On Vols your first listen each and every day. And of course, now on YouTube, you're probably watching this show. Thank you so much for supporting the show on YouTube. Each and every single day, we're up over 335, trying to make that climb to 1,000. Uh, we had one episode last week that hit about uh, 1.5 thousand. That's just the beginning. So we need those views, need those su- subscribers. So please continue to carry the fight on to YouTube. But hey, the NBA trade deadline, trade deadline. Let me try that again. Trade deadline. It is Thursday, February the 10th at three o'clock Eastern time. And the Locked On NBA podcast will be covering it live from two to four. So check in, join with Kim Becker, John Corrales, and Locked On Fantasy Basketball host Josh Floyd to get analysis of every blockbuster move that's made. Subscribe to Locked On NBA on YouTube and turn your notifications on so you know when the show uh, goes live. All right, back here on Locked On Vols, recapping Tennessee's 72-63 win over Mississippi State. Got my buddy Logan Ward on. He produces uh, the Eric Ains show from 9 to noon over at the Sports Animal, so you might hear him there. This is uh, what he looks like here if you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, Logan, we kind of talked, uh, you know, big storylines from this game, the, the great start from Tennessee, the great finish for Tennessee, able to withstand that lull. Uh, Molinar, who came in as, uh, you know, it's Scotty Pippen, it's Molinar, and it's, uh, I forgot the other guy's name, but they're kind of in a, a pack of their own in terms of, you know, scoring the most points per game in the SEC. He's been fantastic. He's He was fantastic last night, scored 16 points. Uh, Brooks had a good game. Jeffries had a good game. All three of those guys, a three-point threat. But when you look at Tennessee, of course, we touched on Josiah Jordan-James. Kennedy Chandler gave everybody a scare, looked like it was just cramps. 18 points, five rebounds, three assists. He was great. Um, you had uh, you had Ziegler and uh, Vescovy that added 11. I mean, this was a team effort from the Volunteers as four different players scored in double figures. Oh, yeah, it was. And that's something that, you know, I've said, hey, you know, you know what you're going to get out of Vescovy and Chandler for the most part. Occasionally, Vescovy is going to go off for, you know, 23-something points, but then also on some other nights, he's going to go 1 of 7 from 3. That's just kind of what you're going to get from a shooter like um, like Vescovy and obviously Chandler. I think Chandler's starting to finally come into his own. He's very, very raw. That was very clear earlier in the season against Arizona, against Villanova, even against North Carolina a little bit, against some of the stiffer competition that Tennessee has played this season. He's been very, very raw, but he's finally starting to come into his own and just honestly becoming a dog that this team can count on. That's not what I was expecting from him really right now, just based off what I saw from him earlier in the season. But I think he's starting to come into his own. But yeah, you mentioned it, you know, the four guys for them, you know, Ziegler, uh, James, Vescovy, Chandler, if they can get production out of even one of Ziegler or Josiah Jordan James a night, and jump up and score, you know, 10 to 12 points a game. I'll say it again. This Tennessee team can jump up a couple of levels of what I believe their potential to be right now, which is on that, you know, round of 32. If they can get one or both of those guys to consistently score 10 to 12 points, sweet 16 team for sure. And it's big because you know what you're going to get from Vescovy every single game. All right. He's going right. to give you at least 10. Okay. He was averaging at one point in time. 14 points in SEC play. That's gone down just a smidge. I think he went into last night averaging 13 points in SEC games, but he's been the most consistent player Tennessee's had all year, and that's great to see because, uh, boy, his shot selection was just horrible his first couple years here. Uh, but And turnovers. Yeah, and turnovers, exactly, especially his freshman year coming in starting at bad. Christmas. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, if you get that point production from a, a James or a Ziegler you know, at least one of those guys a night, that's going to be huge because, you know, Kennedy Chandler, for the most part, is going to get double figures as well from a scoring perspective. So picking up the slack, Olivier Kumwa likely out for the season. Um, It was, he was never a huge offensive threat, but he was starting to kind of come into his own in that regard. So when you get these team-like efforts in terms of scoring, that's obviously huge for Tennessee. So Chandler, I thought, was incredible. He did go down with the cramps. It looked way worse at times. You and I were texting and said, oh boy, this doesn't look good. In his defense, I'll say this. I, I don't know if you've got, if you ever you know had had suffered cramps you know in in baseball or basketball or whatever, but dude, 
Sometimes if you get a bad cramp, it feels like you're dying. Like legit. They're no joke. No, tr- I mean, I mean, people wake up in the middle of the night. I do it occasionally now. If you know, waking up with big cramps in your calves, you you can't bend your knee. But I mean, I mean, no, I texted you and I said, "Uh oh." Well, That's I, all I saw. I thought initially, I thought it, at first it looked like a cramp because he wasn't straightening his leg, and I was like, "Oh, that's just yeah. a cramp." But then, like, just seeing what was like his facial expressions and him laying, him I mean, grabbing I was like, at his knee was what I mean. Oh. I had flashbacks to what I saw on Saturday with Olivier Kumwa. The yeah. injury didn't look that bad, you know, based off the replay. But then I saw him grab for his ankle, and it was kind of, oh no. But then no. He, he came back in and finished the game, so that's. Huge, huge sigh of relief for Tennessee. Oh, uh, it's a blessing for Tennessee. He was he was really, really good last night. Eight of thirteen, made a three pointer, had five rebounds, three assists, did have four turnovers, but Mississippi State was doing a lot to try to confuse him at times. And then Ziegler. I thought Ziegler, though, what he gave you offensively, he was great at the free throw line as well. His defense was impeccable last night. I mean, he uh let's see here. Ziegler had he only is accounted for oh I don't have steals. I have to go to another thing here. Hold on, hold on, stand by. Doesn't work for live podcasting, right? Ziegler, he, he had, five, had steals. five steals. Yeah, I was gonna say because I, I yeah. thought I, I thought I saw two steals. No, he had he was credited with five steals uh, along with Chandler, who had five steals. So what he does on the defensive end too is just really really good. Uh, I I want to ask you about how Tennessee started this game. So the starting lineup for the Volunteers it went Kennedy Chandler at the point, Vescovy at the two, James at the three. It went Brandon Huntley Hatfield at the four and Urus Plavsic at the five. I didn't think that was going to be the starting lineup, but because Mississippi State is so long, it made sense to me. Tennessee went to the four guard lineup a little bit tonight, but Mississippi State, it's just you can't really play like that too often, even though Tennessee plays very, very well with four guards in the small ball with Josiah at the four. But I thought Huntley Hatfield getting four points uh, really early in that game, starting things off in the minutes that Jonas Adu provided for Tennessee. I mean, he only played in his seventh career game for the Volunteers. I thought were huge, specifically in the first 10, 15 minutes of the ball game. Yeah, 12 minutes for Jonas Adu. And, you know, uh, I thought that it was a a big time performance from him, you know, stepping up, you know, because I mean, I mean, me and you have talked about ad nauseum. It's time, you know, with Josiah Jordan James and, you know, other guys not playing that well. And in particular, John Fulkerson kind of having a you know rough mid to late part of the season that we have seen the last two months, you're saying, okay, one of these freshmen, you know, can Plashvich kind of step up being a older guy? Can Huntley Hatfield step up? It's time for these guys to start to expedite their developmental process, and we've started seeing that from Adu and Huntley Hatfield. Now Huntley Hatfield only play 15 minutes and, you know, Adu only 12 minutes, but I think just kind of slowly easing them in, and let's not remember, you know, excuse me, Eric, Let's not forget, going back a couple of days ago, whenever Olivier Cumwall was ruled out, you know, the projected starters on the Tennessee media guide was, you know, Justin Powell. Yeah. And he only played seven minutes tonight. So I think what you saw from this lineup, it was kind of weird. I I was not expecting Huntley Halfold to get the start. I was expecting maybe John Fulkerson, maybe Powell being that guy. But I think what you saw from, you know, Adu and Huntley Hatfield gives Tennessee fans a lot of, you know, hope for the future. And later this year, if they can continue to get good minutes and slowly develop into the players that Tennessee's going to need for them come March. Yeah, I, I think the combination of uh, Jonas Adu and Brandon Huntley Hatfield uh, next year, espe- especially if they're both still here in two years. You have to say that nowadays because of the transfer portal and all that. Yeah. Um, that could be really, really good. I think Adu is so, so both of them are so green, but have really, really good potential. So I liked what they gave Tennessee last night. I, I thought it was huge. Um, I expected Josiah to start at the four, Powell to start at the two, and then you had, or the three or whatever, you know, four guards essentially, and then have one of the fives in there, whether it be Uros, Folky or whatever. That's what I thought they would start out with. But when I saw this starting lineup, it didn't surprise me at all. Maybe it surprised me that it wasn't Fulkerson in there, but uh, just with how long Mississippi State is, that it comes to no shot. But I would expect to see moving forward a lot of that four-guard lineup because Tennessee plays so well in it and has really you know, the last couple of seasons. Uh, we will tie a bow on this edition of Locked on Balls here on the other side. We'll talk closing remarks from Tennessee's win over Mississippi State. Again, that final score was 72 uh, 263 plus a couple of football notes and big pictures looking beyond this win for uh, the Volunteers. For Logan Ward, I'm Mary Kane. Back in a moment here on Locked on Balls. 
Welcome back in here to Locked on Vols, tying a bow on what was a fun uh, Tennessee basketball game, 72-63 over Mississippi State. Again, now, uh, what is it, 18-6 and six on the season, 8-3 and three in the SEC. Had it pulled up a moment ago. Yeah, we got Tennessee 17-6, and 8-3 and three in the SEC, winners of their last six conference games. And as we bring Logan Moore back on here, doing a doing a great job hanging out with me here today, recapping this game, you mentioned something at break, not only about the starting five, which I thought gave Tennessee a big uh, jolt in that basketball game, but it's the closing five. Who's out there in crunch time to end the half, to begin the second half, obviously to end the game. And Olivier Cumwa is a guy that is usually out there for Tennessee. Obviously wasn't last night, but Tennessee had to respond and did so in a good way. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's your normal, you know, you know, three, four guards right there, which are side Jordan James. Uh, Ziegler coming off the bench, then your two, you know, key players, Vescovy and Chandler. And that's, you know, one thing that I thought that, that this Tennessee team was going to miss the most out of Olivier Cumwell. What he's meant to this team on the offensive side of the ball, of, excuse me, of the floor the last several games, as far as spacing, showing that he has the ability, if he needs to, step out in the corner and knock down a three-pointer and allowing the guards like Vescovy uh, James at times has become a lot more aggressive as far as driving to the basket and finishing at the rim, pulling up for uh, for mid range game, and then also Kennedy Chandler just just absolutely just blowing by guys. That's what I thought Tennessee was going to miss the most on the offensive end of the floor. The defense, yes, he's a fantastic defender, and I realized that. But I was looking at the offensive side, what he meant from a spacing standpoint for this offense. John Fulgerson's won't give you that exactly. He has the ability to, you know, step out and, you know, kind of drive a little bit as well. But I think what that this Tennessee team needs to do in crunch time, space the floor, because quite frankly, that's what basketball is. And that's what this Tennessee team does well, space the floor and, you know, play four guards. And we saw that tonight with the emergence of John Fulkerson in that crunch time five. Yeah, Tennessee played 10 players tonight. Obviously, the the new guy that's kind of getting some minutes now would be Jonas Adu, who uh, played 12 minutes in this basketball game, did a lot of good things in the first half. Of course, no Olivier Cumwall. So uh, Tennessee got 20 points off of turnovers for Mississippi State, who turned it over 16 times, only 10 for the University of Tennessee. You remember way back when in the first half, Tennessee led by as many as 12 at 23 to 11. But we mentioned that scoring drought where Mississippi State went on a 7-0 run, taking the lead on a Molinar three-pointer at 29-28. 28-27, but Tennessee does respond, able to hold off, ends the game on a 6-0 run with those crunch time players, as Logan mentioned, and for the final score of 72-63. to uh, 63. Logan, looking ahead, man, um, again, kind of like it starts off, the SEC schedule is pretty challenging, then you have that lull, now it's challenging again. You've got a game against Vanderbilt, which it's always highly competitive, highly combative uh, games against Vanderbilt, the in-state foe, and Jerry Stackhouse. Uh, that'll be at Thompson Bowling Arena this Saturday. Then you hit the stretch here. Okay, you host Kentucky on Tuesday, travel to Fayetteville to take on a red hot Arkansas team next Saturday. Come back home, play Missouri, or you hit the road again, take on Missouri. What Missouri team are you going to get? Because they've been all over the map. Previously ranked, or I guess still at the time, or still right now, number one team in the country. They won't become Monday. Then Auburn comes to town the following Saturday. Georgia, and then Arkansas again. So the the stretch ahead for Tennessee, it's going to be challenging. You're going to miss Olivier Cumwa, but if James can continue to score, not even at this pace, but give you double figures in scoring and, and continue to rebound well and defend well, if Ziegler continues to defend well and give you close to double figures, um, if Kennedy Chandler continues to play like the five-star guard that he is, I mean, some of his – just just his zoomies is what I like to call him. He is so quick, and, and that's why you see like – Everybody's so high on him. I think Tennessee's going to be okay, but obviously you still miss with Olivia Cumwall. But a tough stretch coming up for Tennessee, and that's why last night's win was huge on the road and a, a place that uh, Mississippi State has been undefeated at so far this season. And, you know, Mississippi State, you know, I've called it the very opportunistic stretch of four games, starting with Texas A&M on the road last Saturday against South Carolina, then last night taking down Mississippi State. That's game three of a four-game stretch that I think Tennessee needs to win all four of these games. Now, you have Vanderbilt coming in to Thompson Bowling Green on Saturday. A Vanderbilt team that is playing pretty darn good basketball ever since Tennessee beat them in Memorial, you know, earlier, I guess, you know, three, four weeks ago. The team around Scottie Pippen Jr., I've been saying for, you know, ad nauseum all season long that I believe Scottie Pippen Jr. is the best, if not 
one of the one or two best in the entire conference. They have a lot of guys around him that that are starting to emerge. But then, as you mentioned, you know, the rest of the schedule, we know how good Kentucky is. I think right now the best team in the country, Arkansas, red hard Arkansas team. I've told people for weeks now, you don't let Arkansas get hot. If Arkansas gets hot with how well they are coached and how much talent they have out on the perimeter and how much they can just light it up if they are hot, that's bad news, bad, bad news for the SEC. And Arkansas has finally figured it out on the offensive end. Then Missouri, as you mentioned, no clue what what Missouri team you'll get. You, you might get the Missouri team that almost beat Auburn a couple of weeks ago. You might get the Missouri team that got blown out by like 40-something a month ago. Yeah. And then Auburn again. You know, it's it's a tough stretch, but I think just win the games you were supposed to win because right now you're trying to project and get that top four seed heading into the SEC tournament down in Tampa. And if Tennessee can just win the games they're supposed to win against Vanderbilt, against Missouri, Tennessee should be a top four seed in Tampa. Yeah, you look at the standings right now, Tennessee would be that four seed. They have an 8-3 and three record tied with Arkansas in the SEC. It would be Auburn at 10-1. and one. UK would be, Kentucky would be the two seed. Then there's a little bit of a drop-off right now. Two games back is Florida at 6-5. and five, And then Mississippi State now falls to 5-5 five and five in conference play. Uh, they would be the sixth seed. So Tennessee's got a two-game leg up on Florida, who who is currently the fifth seed. And, of course, you want to be a top-four seed heading in uh, to the SEC tournament. All right, Logan, great job, man. Before we let you go, before we call quits here on Locked on Balls, sorry, something is falling beneath my feet here. I want to mention that Tennessee did uh, get four invitations to the NFL Scouting Combine, and that's what you want. It is the biggest job interview of your life. But I think 324 players only got invitations there. So it's, an, it's you know, not everybody gets to go there. Everybody gets a pro day, sure, but only the best of the best get invited to the combine. Doesn't mean you're going to be drafted, but usually if you're at the combine, you have a great chance of being a draft pick. Tennessee uh, invites extended to Valus Jones, Cade Mays, Matthew Butler, and of course, Alante Taylor. No Theo Jackson. Are you surprised Theo Jackson wasn't invited to uh, the NFL combine? You know, not really, because I think, you know, just kind of projecting ahead, you know, guys who go to the combine, you want to see what they're going to project, you know, further down the line. Now, Theo Jackson might be a very fine player, and, you know, I don't think he's going to get drafted, but I think down the line he's going to be a, you know, good practice squad player and potentially compete for a roster spot years down the line in the NFL. But I think just, you know, as far as the talent coming out of Tennessee this season, I think they got it 100% right. I would expect all four of these guys to potentially get drafted if they're not drafted they're going to be that you know you know unsigned free agent right away but I mean I think they got it right with Valus Jones Matthew Butler Elante Taylor and Cade Mays three of which I think are going to be drafted you know day two day three um, in the NFL draft so I think that that's a a very very good showing for Tennessee I think that that's the right four for the balls yeah I would say that's the right four as well if there was a fifth it would be uh it would be Theo um, he did get invited to the Shrine Bowl. He was a late addition, but remember Theo was kind of a one a one year wonder, and it was it was a great year for Theo. Really good uh, year. The four, yeah, the four or I guess maybe five previous years weren't as good for uh, Theo Jackson. But Bayless Jones, the fact that he's so versatile with his return game, Alante Taylor has been practicing a little bit of safety as well. Matthew Butler had a fine end of his career, and Gabe Mays, the versatility is there. I, I look at all four of these guys as uh, being early day three. Um, maybe a maybe K, maybe Alante late, late, late day two. That's kind of where they Cade fall right before now. Before Alante, personally, yeah. Uh, so you know we'll have to see. And of course, all the all these numbers will move around with all the different mock drafts uh, leading up to the NFL draft. So wanted to make note of that: Bayless Jones, Cade Mays, Matthew Butler, and Alante Taylor all invited uh, to the NFL Combine. Uh, that is held March the 1st through the 8th in Indianapolis. And, of course, the draft uh, will uh, come a couple months after that. So, uh, fun show. Logan Moore, great job, man. Tell everybody listening and watching where they can find more of your work and uh, when they can hear you on the radio. Yeah, on Twitter, at Logan Ward 98 Feels like 98, as I say. And then on the uh, the Eric Gaines Show every weekday morning, 9 to noon. Then on Saturday, Sports Talk, pretty much every Saturday with you right now from uh, 8 to 10. Yeah, looking forward to that Saturday show. We're going to preview uh, the Super Bowl, talk a ton of Tennessee hoops, a little Tennessee football. It's going to be game. a fun time. Were you born in 1998, by the way? I was, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, um, October 22nd, 1998. Okay, okay. So Logan Ward, 98. That's probably why it's in there. But it feels like 98. Don't even remember it. All right, catch Logan there on Twitter. Logan, good job, man. 
Yeah, man. All right. That'll do it here for this episode of Locked On Balls. Can't thank you enough for hanging out with us here today as we recap Tennessee's more I think about it, this is a big win for the Volunteers. 12-1 and one was the record for Mississippi State uh, at home this season. Actually, wasn't undefeated, but 12-1. and one. Mississippi State continues to only have one win in the quadrant one realm so far this season. Another loss, of course, Tennessee is a quad one loss as well. But you continue to gain separation between Florida, who sits at fifth currently in the SEC standings. Tennessee uh, looking like the four seed, but a tough stretch ahead. Again, as we mentioned, two games against Arkansas. A game against Kentucky, a game against Auburn, a game against Mizzou, and a game against Georgia as well. We'll have it all right here on Locked On Balls, previewing and, of course, recapping all that is Tennessee hoops. Uh, for Logan Ward, I am Eric Kane. Guys, thanks so much for making Locked On Balls your first listen. Go and give a look at Locked On SEC. Make that your second listen. Chris Gordy, Locked On SEC. Great guests all around the SEC each and every day. Make Locked On SEC your second listen each and every day. Check out the show on YouTube if you haven't already. Subscribe, and uh, we'll talk to you guys again on a feel-good Friday coming up tomorrow here on Locked on Balls.